Hello, everyone. Looks like we're letting a lot of people into the meeting right now, so we'll wait a couple seconds, see if we can get everybody in that has registered. My name is Cliff Davis. I'm going to be talking with you all today about architectural control committee issues. By no matter what the name you call your architectural review authority, which is the term that the, the property code uses. And um, we're going to talk a little bit about that today and we'll get we'll go ahead and get started. There's our little disclaimer. So everything we're talking about today is based on what we know as of today, which the way things go in Texas courts, it could all change tomorrow. But the first thing we want to talk about is just kind of a, a reminder of something that's not new in the law. It's the 209 letter. And on the, the next slide, we'll talk about that, is that hopefully you all know now that this has been the law for quite a while that before an association can uh, file a lawsuit on something other than an assessment, issue a fine, uh, charge an owner for property damage, the association has to send what we refer to as a 209 letter. And that 209 letter has to meet some certain statutory requirements. And the reference to 209 is a reference to Texas Property Code Chapter 209, which is one of the primary laws that govern associations. It has the most regulations on associations so that's something that that if you're a board member or a property manager you're probably already familiar with it if you're a board member or, or a new board member that's something you may want to try to get familiar with so that you can uh, understand where your attorneys and your managers are coming from when they tell you certain things that have to be done so typically let's say for a deed restriction violation you've got to tell the owner describe what the violation is if you're trying to find them, you've got to give them a reasonable period to cure the violation and avoid the fine or suspension. Um, there's some exceptions if the owner was given a notice in the previous six months and the letter has to tell the owner that they uh, can request a hearing. They've got 30 days after the day the notice was sent to request a hearing before the board and the letter has to tell owners that they may have special rights under the Service Member Civil Relief Act if they're serving on active duty in uh, the military. And it's uh, something to, to keep in mind too is that this 209 letter applies to fines, charging for property damage, deed restriction violations. There is another 209 letter, another section in the property code of a letter that has to be sent before you can collect attorney fees for filing an assessment collection lawsuit. So we're not really talking about today, but just be aware that there is a 209 letter for collections also. So like I said, the. Uh, missed one there. OK, so that, that th these are the instances in which you have to uh, send the 209 filing a lawsuit other than a suit to collect an assessment, foreclose a lien, charge an owner for property damage, levy a fine of the governing documents. Like I said, one of the, the requirements of that letter is that the, that the letter advise the owner that they can request a hearing before the board. And what we're talking about today specifically really is when they request a hearing before the board, maybe about an architectural control committee issue, and they don't like the decision if that decision comes from an architectural control committee. So let's talk about the architectural control committee a little bit. Due to a law change last year, the law now prohibits a person from serving on the architectural control committee if they're a current board member, the spouse of a current board member, or if they live in a current, current board member's household. So this has had a, a big effect uh, on a lot of associations. It's important to note that this law excludes associations that have 40 or less lots or is during the development period. So if you're if you're one of those two, this law is not applicable to you. And uh, a big problem that this law has caused is that a lot of associations, you know, have difficulty getting people to serve on the board, much less to serve on a separate committee. And that has become an issue because the board should not have a say in approving or disapproving architectural control committee applications. And we get a lot of questions on, you know, what can we do about this? How, how are we going to uh, address this problem if we can't get volunteers? We have some associations that have made a deal with their management company to, in effect, serve as the ACC. 
We have some that have uh, hired third parties to serve as the ACC. Obviously, there's a cost involved with that, and it can be tricky to charge that cost back to the owner. Uh, absent language in your governing documents that may allow you to charge that cost back to the owner if you're using a third party as the ACC. Uh, some management companies really aren't interested in serving on the ACC. So if you're if you're trying to use your management company, you may have to talk to them. And you know, there's there's some instances where you just may not be able to find anyone to serve as your ACC. And in that instance, what we're recommending is that you be able to show that you have taken every possible effort to recruit an architectural control committee, sending out emails, sending a letter to every owner. Um, obviously, if somebody submits an application, it needs to be reviewed. And in some cases, the board is continuing to review those. But if they're doing so, you've got to be able to show you've taken every step and you continue to take reasonable efforts on a consistent basis to recruit an ACC. And keep in mind that an ACC can be one person. So, you know, if you can get one person to help you with that, to serve on your architectural control committee, then you've fulfilled your obligation. That's not on the board. So the important thing to remember about an ACC denial is that the law now says that, that you can appeal that decision to the board of directors. And kind of another really important thing that's part of the, the new laws that took effect last year is when you send an ACC denial now, you can't just say it's denied. You have to describe in reasonable detail the reasons for that denial. And if there's something that the owner could do that would make you approve it or conditionally approve it, you need to put that in your denial letter too. And that's kind of a, a somewhat new thing. Some associations were already doing that. Some would just say it was denied and it would be somewhat vague as to why. And owners would ask, you know, I, I'm not sure I understand why it was denied. And now the law requires that an owner should be able to read their denial letter and understand the reason or reasons why it was denied. Once that denial is sent to the owner, and um, the law now allows that to be sent by certified mail, by electronic means, by hand delivery, um, at a minimum, you should send it. If you're going to email it, I would probably also put a copy in the mail, not necessarily certified, but a regular mail. Uh, the best way I still believe on ACC denials is to send them by certified mail because you don't necessarily have to prove that the owner received it, but a certified mailing is proof that you sent it timely. And that's an argument that we see a lot is either the owner claims they didn't get the, the denial or they claim that um, it wasn't sent. And if you have a certified mailing, you've got proof of when it was sent and that it was sent. And if you send it by certified mail, I'd also send it a copy by regular mail also. Once that denial is put out there, the owner's got 30 days to request a hearing in front of the board. And it's 30 days from the date the notice is mailed. If the board gets a request for an appeal of an ACC denial, that hearing must be held within 30 days. And you have to give the owner at least 10 days of the date, time, and place of that hearing. So this is kind of the same procedure of when you send a 209 deed restriction violation letter. You've got to have the same right to the hearing. The owner has that same right to request a hearing. And the requirement is the same and that you have to give the owner 10 days notice of the date, time, and place of the hearing. So on an ACC denial, same thing. If they want an appeal before the board, you've got to send um, the notice of the hearing. It's got to be held within 30 days. And you've got to send them at least, give them at least 10 days warning of the date time and place of that hearing. During that hearing, the board or uh, the designated representative of the board or the representative of the owner can discuss, verify facts, and hopefully resolve the denial by the ACC. The um, board and the owner are both permitted to postpone for a period of not more than 10 days. And both parties or either party can record the 209 hearing um, the appeal hearing. So, you know, a lot of times we'll get contacted by a manager and say, we, we deny somebody they've asked for a hearing, but our next board meeting is not till 40 days from now. And the board only wants to do these at, you know, as, as part of the board hearing, uh, the board of, uh, the board meeting, which we'll talk about that also in a minute. So a lot of times, uh, the best thing to do is try to just try to work out an agreement with the owner. So the law, 
gives the baseline of when the hearing has to be held, but you can, by agreement, have it at a different date. So the important thing to do is we want to go back and talk about the ACC applications is remember that your restrictions likely have a time frame in which you have to respond. Uh, it's typically 30 days, but we've seen 45 days, we've seen 60 days. And if you don't respond to that application within that time period, a lot of restrictions say that it's deemed approved. And that's even if the application is, is incomplete. And I want to touch on that a minute. You know, a lot of times associations will get an application and it'll be missing something. They'll say, I want to paint my house, but they don't give you the, the colors, the little paint cards of what colors they want. And a lot of times an association may say, hey, you didn't give us everything we need, so we need these paint cards. Well, if the application is incomplete, you still have to remember once you receive it, it starts that clock ticking if your documents have that 30-day approval period. So the best advice is if its if application is insufficient is to send a denial letter. And again, you've got to explain in that denial letter why. So on a paint house that they didn't submit the colors, you would deny it and say, please reapply and submit the colors or color that you want to use in your application. So it is important, we believe, that if you have an in, uh, incomplete information on an application, to send a denial letter and explain what is needed to consider the application. We've dealt with cases uh, over the years where somebody tried to play gotcha. They got a letter that wasn't an approval or denial. They sat on it and waited till the 30 days passed. And then they said, well, I'm deemed approved because you didn't deny my letter within my application within 30 days. And that's what the documents require. So obviously you wanna avoid that situation. So I also want to tell everybody that if you've got questions during this, you can sub submit those to the chat feature. Uh, when we're done, we're going to take all the questions that we can take in the, in the time we have. So just keep that in mind and, and uh, you can start submitting your questions now if you have something. So um, typically the Architectural Control Committee is a committee of the association, a committee that's appointed by the board, and it may go by various names, Architectural Control Committee, Design Review Committee, Modifications Committee, New Construction Committee. The property co code refers to all of these as the Architectural Review Authority. And you always wanna look in your, your documents and see, you know, what is your committee name and look in your documents to confirm um, what your time limit is to approve or deny. There are some restrictions out there that it's, a 30 day response time or the application is deemed denied. They're uh, somewhat rare, but those those are out there. So if you're serving on an ACC or if you're serving on a board, and obviously if you're a manager, you wanna be familiar with how your committee is set up, what your time period is, and the effects of not responding in that time period. If it's a automatic approval, which is gonna be in the, the case most of the time, or if it's a denial. Now let's talk about the actual hearing. It, it, in kind of an odd quirk in the law, the property code says that the appeal of an ACC denial has to be held in the open session of a property notice meeting. Uh, that's typically something you wouldn't think would be in the open session, that it would be part of you know, a, a private hearing or in the executive session. But um, on this slide here, if you're a board member and if you're a property manager, this is something you should definitely take away from this. If you take away one thing is that the items listed on here, the 15 items are all decisions are things that have to be done in the open session of a property notice board meeting. And you'll see that ACC appeals is on this list. Most people probably don't want to have their hearing in the open session. And again, that's where you can work with them. Um, and to an agreement of having it in the executive session or having it at some other time uh, out of a meeting, if that's what you can get them to agree to. But some may insist <clears throat> that you have it in the open session. And if they do, that's what the law says, and that's what the board will have to do. So typically in the executive session, these are the types of things you would discuss. And these are all straight from the property code personnel decisions, uh, pending or threatened litigation, contract negotiations, enforcement actions, 
attorney-client communications and individual owner issues. So if you're going to have a hearing in the open session and uh, in a ACC appeal hearing, and your executive session comes before that time, you can discuss some of the specifics, and probably you might be discussing those with your attorney. That can be done in the executive session, or like I said, if the owner agrees, you can have the hearing in the executive session. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, probably one of the uh, most common things we see boards doing incorrectly is discussing things in the executive session that should be being discussed in the open session. You know, the, the intent of the law really is for all board business to be discussed in the open session. Now they've carved out these exceptions for the executive session. So if you're on a board and you're you're talking about something, or if you're a manager and you see the board talking about something that's not one of these items that are here on the slide, then that's really something that's probably needs to be discussed in the open session. So that, that's just something else to to uh, keep in mind. Once you come out of an executive session, too, we want to remind everybody that you have to sum summarize orally what happened in that executive session including expenditures approved and put those in the meeting minutes. But having said that, there really shouldn't be those types of decisions made on approving expenditures in an executive session. That should all be open session items that you're discussing. You know, the, 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 the thing we try to stress a lot is, is to be reasonable. A lot of times emotions can get in the way of um, our, our become part of these decisions on, on really anything, including ACC appeals, ACC denials, ACC approvals. Um, and we always ask boards to say, you know, try to be reasonable, look at it from the owner. You know, they, they want to put in their pool and they think I'm just going to send this letter in and it's going to get approved. And all of a sudden they get a letter back and that letter may be a denial. It may be a threat of a fine or a lawsuit if they proceed. You know, so keep in mind that these people are your neighbors and, you know, it's how would you like to be treated if you're in that situation? Um, you know, there are some owners who know what they're doing and try to game the system, but a, a lot of them don't really understand the system. You know, it, it's when you buy a house, there's nothing in, in the law that requires you be given a copy of your deed restrictions. A lot of title companies supply those with a thousand other documents you're looking at when you're closing. Very few people ever read those and don't understand a lot of times that they're buying into an association, that they're buying into something where they have to get approval for almost everything they do that's exterior related. So, you know, try to presume that they just don't know um, and try to work with them when they do have a question or when they don't understand why something that uh, is denied that they think is reasonable. So, you know, keep all, keep all that in mind when you're dealing with owners and also keep in mind is, is, you know, whenever someone, a board talks to us or a manager talks to us about something that might be in dispute or something that might be controversial, you know, we look at it from one way is what is a judge or a jury going to say if they hear this or what are they going to think about this? And we try to remind the board that, you know, you, you've got to view all of your actions or, or try to review them all through the prism of what is a judge or a jury going to say about how the association has acted in this. And it can be very frustrating because judges and juries expect the association to bend over backwards being reasonable, while owners, they don't necessarily think, have to be reasonable all the time. And I'm sure all of you out there have dealt with owners that aren't reasonable. Um, but, you know, when you're in front of a judge or a jury, you have to keep in mind that they don't know the history. They don't know this owner that's involved. They don't know if he's a nice person or somebody who has always, um, you know, tried to stretch the rules or push the rules to the edge. And they're seeing it for the first time. So kind of the, the lesson here is you, you've got to try to be reasonable. You've got to think about if something looks like it's heating up into a real dispute is you know, how is this going to play out in court? Can we show that we've been reasonable? Something to uh, to to keep in mind too is is when you're emailing uh, board members or managers to be careful what you write in those emails. You should assume as a board member that uh, every association 
uh, every email you send is going to be on a poster board in front of a judge or a jury. And people tend to say things in emails that they might not say out loud. But if there's a lawsuit that gets filed, there's a good chance that uh, your emails might be part of that lawsuit. And right or wrong, if you have something on there where you're talking negatively about personal things about the owner, uh, that's not going to look good for the association. So, so just keep that in mind too. You know, we generally advise all board members that for their association business, that you should get a web-based email that you only use for association business. Don't mix it with your personal email. Um, you know, you, you, it, it's in theory, uh, it could happen that if there's a lawsuit, you know, a judge could order that you produce your personal computer so that the other side can go through it looking for emails that they think you've sent. Or you send an email that you haven't produced in discovery and there's like, well, they're hiding other emails. So really what you want is a web-based email so that if there is a dispute, you just hand it over and say, here it is, you know, go for it, search all you want. And obviously you don't want emails in there that uh, are offensive or, or kind of air out personal differences with owners that are that you're having a, a dispute with. We get a lot of questions about variances. Um, and I think a lot of people assume that the board or the ACC has the authority to grant a variance. We do not believe that is so. We believe that if you're going to grant a variance, there has to be variance authority in your governing documents. So, you know, it's it's with any question on any issue that the association has, the first place to look is what is in your governing documents. They can tell you a lot of what you can or can't do, and variances is one of those. There are a lot of documents that do have variance authority, so one thing you need to look at is who has the power to grant that variance. Is it the board? And now with this new law about separate architectural control committees, the other question is, is it the board that has the power or is it the architectural control committee that has the power to grant the variance? And so that, that can be something that can be kind of a trap for associations of did the correct entity, being the board or the ACC, grant the variance? And you want to make sure you've looked at your documents for variance authority, who has the right to give that variance, and make sure that if a variance is given, it's that entity, that group, that committee that has actually granted the variance. I typically advise that if it's the ACC that has the authority and they're going to grant the variance, the board also sign off on it just to show that they are in approval of it also. If I was an owner attorney, I would want the board to also agree to the variance in addition to the architectural control committee. You know, a lot of times you got to ask what type of variance they're asking for. Is it a variance about the use of the property or is it about an architectural control committee issue with the property. And, you know, sometimes the documents can say that there's variance authority for architectural issues, but not for use issues. So, so again, you read that variance language, see if you have it, read it, understand it, understand when you can grant a variance and what conditions. You know, th there's some sample language here. And in this one, it limits variance authority to Circumstances su such as topography, natural obstructions, hardship, aesthetic, environment, uh, or other relevant considerations, which is a fairly broad term. So you've got to see if the if there is variance authority, if it's limited, or if it's just unfettered to where it's just the board can do this. One thing to remember about variances is that once you grant a variance, it, it most likely you're going to have to grant the exact same variance to anyone that's in similar situations. Um, you know, variance, uh, variances can be tricky because once you give somebody one, other people may say, well, I've got that same situation and where they actually, they may have it, but they may not have it too. But, you know, if you don't give them a variance, they're going to complain about it. So you've got to be able really when you grant a variance to distinguish why you're giving that variance so that if you have somebody in a similar situation, you can give them the variance. But if you don't, and that owner is asking for a variance, you can point to those reasons and say, well, that person got a variance because, you know, their lot is configured such that they couldn't comply with that setback or wh whatever that reason may be. You, you want to be able to articulate the reasons when you give a variance in order to just not have everyone asking for a variance. The, the slide says they must be recorded. That's not necessarily the case. There are some deed restrictions that require recording. 
probably a good idea to record them all. Um, there might be some exceptions to that. But, you know, if I'm an owner and I have to build something that violates the setback, but I have a variance for it, you know, I want that filed of record so that when I go to try to sell the house and a survey gets done and a title company or the buyer says, hey, wait a minute, you've got a violation, you know, you can say, well, that I have a variance, it's filed with the county, so that that's not something that, you know, you're going to be pursued after I sell you this house. Again, you know, you've got to see what authority the variance is. It's typically going to be architectural control authority, not use authority. A lot of uh, language about variances just states expressly that the ACC or the board can grant a variance, but they cannot grant a variance as to use. They can't grant a variance as to single family use. A lot of them have language in there, uh, but you've really got to read and understand that that language. And um, again, this talks about what I talked about last time. A lot of restrictions um, have some language of when you can grant a variance. And this kind of gives you um, some guidance, you know, and also is something that if, if they meet one of these, you can point out to the owner that's asking for a variance that's not really in a similar situation is point to these requirements if that's what's in your deed restrictions and explain why one owner met them while the current owner asking for it did not meet the requirements to uh, be considered for variances. So another thing we'll talk about briefly here is swimming pool fences. Um, there was a new law that that talked about swimming pool fences. Um, apparently someone somewhere got their fence denied. And so the uh, in 2021, a new law took effect that says you just simply cannot deny an owner from installing a swimming pool enclosure that conforms to applicable state or local safety standards. You can enforce a restriction or a rule regarding the appearance of the enclosure, a regulation of colors, but you can't, for example, pro uh, prohibit a black swimming pool enclosure. So the law expressly protects swimming pool enclosures and is a little more detailed in that it uh, specifically allows black swimming pool enclosures. My guess is someone put up a black swimming pool enclosure and either got a violation letter or got sued for it. And uh, as a result, they, they knew a representative and got this law passed. So keep in mind that you can't just outright deny a swimming pool enclosure. I'm not sure why you would want to anyway, as it is a, a safety issue. Um, and so keep that in mind when one comes across that if you've got questions, you should contact your attorney to uh, to see if, if it's any way protected by law. Kind of one of the more controversial laws that was passed was regarding security measures. And associations are now prevented from restricting installation of security measures, which includes cameras, motion detectors, and probably most notably perimeter fencing. So almost every set of deed restrictions has a restriction that you can't build a fence forward of the residence or you can't build a fence in the front yard of a residence. Those are now out the window. The law will allow you to build a fence around the perimeter of your lot as a security measure. And the law gives us very little guidance on how an association can regulate that. It says that we can regulate the type of fencing, whatever that means. So right now, we don't know if that means the materials, the height, you know, what it means really. And I'm sure that in the next few years, we will have some cases where an association is trying to regulate a perimeter fencing and an owner decides that that's out of the association's authority and challenges that regulation. We do recommend that you have a security measures policy in place to regulate to the extent that the board wants to those security measure uh, fencing. You know, for example, typically in the policies that we write, we, we say that the front yard perimeter fencing has to be wrought iron fencing. Um, you know, you obviously or probably don't want someone to build, build a six foot wood cedar fence and enclose their front yard and enclose their driveway. So that's arguably the type of fencing. And that's something we think that for now that we can regulate. 
So keep that in mind that if you have not adopted a security measures policy that attempts to address some of these things, you're going to have a hard time denying somebody who wants to put in a security measure um, because you won't be able to point to anything that says you can't do that. You know, generally, anytime you're denying whether it's a security measure or anything involved with the ACC, and you say you can't do that, you have to be able to point to some language in your declaration or in your guidelines that is, uh, performs the basis uh, of that denial. So you can't just say, no, we don't like it, or you shouldn't just say that. Um, you typically want to say, well, you can't build your garage you know, a foot from your neighbor's property because the restrictions say it has to be at least three feet or five feet or whatever that setback is. So you always are in a stronger position if you can point to language in your documents that is the basis for your ACC denial. So really, you know, what we're talking about is, is, and I'm sure this is something you all know, is that the ACC process is important. It, it allows the association some control over how people modify and improve their property. It, you know, is intended to give the association a chance to review what somebody wants to do, make sure it complies with their documents, and if it doesn't, to inform the owner that it doesn't comply. And now the law just is a little more detailed on what you have to tell the owner. You have to tell them why. You have to tell them what they could do to um, bring bring their application into compliance into something that can be approved. And you know, hopefully, the goal is to kind of maintain property value and not have an association where you drive through and there's storage sheds in the front yard and just you know crazy things like that. So that's really all I have to say for now. But I hope that we can answer some questions. Kyle, I don't see anything in the chat. I don't know if you see it. Uncle, if there are lots of questions. I imagine there are. Can I'm I see still... those or? Yeah, you should be able to see them. Just click on the chat. If not, I can go ahead and read them and start oh, reading them okay. for you. Now I found them. I'll go up to the top. What was the reasoning for the ACC members law? You know, we don't know for sure. We can only guess that someone somewhere thought that the board had too much control to act as the board and the architectural control committee my personal experience with this is that you know somebody gets mad because something they liked got denied and they think the board has too much authority and they thought it would be a good idea to separate acc from the board which you know maybe in theory that's a good idea but in practice it, it's it's presented a problem for a lot of associations and you know we're encouraging every manager every owner especially that's experienced every board member that's experiencing these problems to contact your state representative and let them know the problems you're having with this law and um you know it's, it's typically going to be a difficulty getting people to serve finding people to serve which is you know a lot of the associations we represent the board always acted as the acc because they just simply could not find people willing to take on that job. It's like a board member. It is a thankless job. Minimum committee size. You know, unless your documents specify a architectural control committee and a size, then it can be one person. So again, you know, like with every question you have about what can we do or not do, the starting point is always your governing documents. Let's see, I have a homeowner that was wants to appeal an architectural variance. Do I have to put together a packet the same as would for a deed restriction matter? I, that That's not a requirement in the law, but I think it is a good idea to do that. And let me just make sure about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I would recommend that you do put that packet together. Um, to avoid any argument about compliance and the, the hearing process. If the community has ACC volunteers, can the community choose to use a company instead of the volunteers? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a board decision on uh, on what, how you use and, and, and form your ACC. Again, the only caveat Caveat to that would be if your governing documents require that there be an ACC, ACC committee made up of, of owners or members.
What if the ACC approves a hot pink lime green house? Can the board overrule that decision legally? We don't think so that you can do that. The board um, simply cannot be involved in ACC decisions unless it is an appeal. And this is also a problem that we're seeing where boards are complaining of these kind of rogue ACCs. We do think it is acceptable for the board to have an ACC liaison who kind of meets with the ACC or sees the applications um, as long as that person isn't trying to sway anyone's vote and monitors the decisions of the ACC. You know, the, the board can require that all decisions be um, provided to the, to, to the board and they can review them. And if you have an ACC that is doing things they should not be doing, then typically the board has the authority to appoint and remove ACC members, and that might be the way you have to control it. So again, you have to confirm if you're going, to, if the board's going to appoint and remove, that you, that's what your governing documents say is that the board has that authority. We have seen a few where the ACC is truly a separate entity that may be elected by the members, but typically the board is going to have the authority to appoint and remove, and you may have to exercise that uh, that authority. see there's a, a lot of comments in here the portion of the ccrs addressing the acc expired but the association opted to keep the acc but it is voluntary the ccr still set a 30-day timeline for approval does this stand with the voluntary acc um, I, I mean i think i would encourage the acc to respond within that 30 days uh, my guess would be that a lot of the owners may not know that the ACC is voluntary unless that's been made crystal clear to them. Um, and some may just submit to the process, even if they do know that, so that they won't have a problem down the road with the association. But I, I, I think the best advice would be just still follow that procedure. You cannot pause the process. Um, this question may be directed toward the insufficient information in the application and we recommend against pausing the process we in that case we rec recommend a denial with an explanation of what's needed to uh, consider that ACC must the hearing be open to the members does the board vote be at an open board meeting if you per the property code the hearing has to be um, in front of the members and the vote has to be in front of the members what if the fee, what if there's a fee associated with the application and it's not paid? Does the clerk start when the application is received, even though required fee has not been paid? You know, in order to avoid any argument about that, I would send a denial letter and tell them that you have to submit the fee. And that way there's no fight about that. Let's see, keep going down here. Somebody saying they've been told that the application is not complete until there's enough information. And what you said is contradicting that. I think that if anyone in this firm said that, then I, I, I think, let me clarify. We believe that if you don't have sufficient information, you should send a denial letter. And that avoids any argument about when the clock starts or if there's been a deemed approval. If the board wishes to conduct the hearing at its next board meeting in two months, the homeowner does not agree to that. What is the timeline limit to hold a special meeting, a special board meeting to conduct the hearing? So the hearing has to be held within 30 days of the date that you receive the request, the appeal request, and you've got to give 10 days written notice. So that's the timeline to keep in mind. Um, you know, and that's something for managers just have to uh, to understand that when they get that ACC appeal that a, the clock has started ticking and you know you need to jump on that right away and make sure you've calendared all the deadlines the 30 days to hold the hearing the 10 days notice of the date time and place of the hearing is there any way to pre-approve certain projects who would be able to update the rules for example fence staining as long as it's a shade of brown um, you know, kind of, I guess, these non-controversial things. I think there probably is a way to do that. I would suggest you talk to your attorney about what you would need to put in place. 
I mean, I think we would probably recommend that you put down in writing as maybe part of ACC guidelines of what you don't have to get approval for or what the board will approve, get that filed with the county that you're in. Wouldn't open session hearings be deemed confidential? Well, again, you would think that these hearings would be confidential, but that's just not the way the law is written right now, is that um, the ACC appeals from ACC denials have to be held in the open session of a properly noticed board meeting. Not clear on appeal, is it open or executive? The way the law is written, it is should be in the open session of a properly noticed board meeting. Again, the hearings I've dealt with, in most cases, the owner has agreed to hold it either in an executive or as a separate matter directly with the board. I've heard the owner has a choice, which is it? So if the owner wants to do it in private and the board agrees, then you can do it in private. Is this video going to be available to provide to a board or committee? I think Kyle can correct me if I'm wrong, but typically, Kyle, do we put these up on our website? Yes, sir. They'll be up on YouTube probably on Friday. It's usually when I get to them. YouTube. All right. Do people need approval for things that are not visible from the street, like putting in a patio or changing out a back door? You know, it depends on your restrictions. You know, typically any exterior change is going to need approval. As a practical matter, a lot of times you can only regulate what you can see. You know, for the deed restriction violation drive throughs, our advice is do not leave the street. Um, I think most management companies instruction to their employees is do not leave your car. So it can be difficult to find something that's in the backyard. A lot of times that'll be generated by a neighbor complaint. And then depending on what that is, you know, the board will have to make a decision is, is does it violate the restrictions? And is that something we're going to pursue? If you're going to pursue something that can't be seen, that can only be seen by a neighbor, you know, a lot of times the neighbors don't want their names involved. And sometimes you have to explain to them, look, the only way we can pursue this is if you are willing to testify if necessary because you know we didn't see this we can't see it only you can see it and sometimes it's it's necessary for neighbors to become involved whether they want to or not you know we typically advise associations if an owner gets a complaint about something a lot of times our first question is well who told you this i want to know who it was and we typically say look you, you don't have to give that information up but if a lawsuit is filed you are going to have to give that information up. So neighbors can't hide behind the association uh, in some cases. They're, at some point, they may need to testify um, or they're, you know, they need to understand that their name will be given if it, the dispute gets to a certain point. Is that it, Kyle? Now, there should be Sarah, plenty more. Which one was the last one you left off at, Cliff? It's 11.51 uh, a.m. Okay. Uh, so approval? Can the board reject a property owner's request to volunteer as an ACC member? Yeah, the board can pick the ACC. Um, okay. Now, you, you, you're going to have a problem if, that's, if you need an ACC and that's the only owner. Um, you might have to rethink that. But, and again... Look at your documents, and if the board has the appointment removal authority, then yes, the board can decide who does or does not serve on the ACC. You might face some political backlash for not letting people on, but if that's what your documents say, that's that's the board's authority and the board's decision. Okay. Can CCRs be amended just to change the reasons for graining a variance? Yes. That'll take a vote of the owners, and the amendment is going to require either 67% of the owners that are covered by that document, which may be your entire subdivision, or you may have a sub a association with various subdivisions, various sections, and it may require an amendment by just the owners in that particular section 
Um, so that's another thing where you just have to look at the document, understand what it takes to amend, which will be 67%, or if your deed restrictions have a lower percentage, the lower percentage controls. Okay, next question. What if there is not variance authority language in uh, the governing document? If, if there's not variance authority in the declaration or the deed restrictions, we don't think you have variance authority. Now, if you have architectural guidelines and somebody wants a variance for those, you know, it's a good idea to put that variance authority just as to the guidelines. Uh, but we think you can grant a variance for those because those are typically board adopted. But we don't think you can grant a variance to a provision in the declaration unless the de declaration says you can grant a variance. Okay. If you have an application that needs more information and you email to request it, does it restart the clock for the 30 days once you receive the information needed, or is the 30 days from the original application date? Again, that's that situation we have where we our recommendation is you issue a denial and tell them what you need to consider the application. Um, so it's it's if we think it's important to do that, or else you may find yourself in a situation where somebody says, well. You didn't approve or deny, and that's what the documents say you have to do within 30 days. Most documents don't speak to telling people we don't have everything. Okay. If a community CCRs talk of variances, but not about the turnaround time regarding regular architectural applications that are not requesting a variance, what do we do? I'm not sure I understand, but I, I, I may be asking. Um, how long you have to respond yeah, if someone asks a variance? Um, you know, if, if it's if that's not spelled out in the declaration, there's really not a time limit. But you know, I, I would I would respond within whatever your time limit is. If it's 30 days, then at least within 30 days. You know, you don't want some somebody to make an argument that the application for a variance is equal to an ACC application. So I would just make sure you respond within that same time frame. Okay, next question. Uh, can you define what a black swimming pool enclosure is a little more? Can it, can it be a black painted fence? I, I think that's, I have seen these, uh, they're like a, probably made out of metal and they come in sections that people put around their pool so they can be moved. I, I, I think that's probably what we were talking about here. Um, is a black fence in effect. OK, next question goes to front yard fences. Can they be completely prohibited? We do not think they can be completely prohibited. That's the, the purpose of this law was to allow perimeter fencing. Now, you know, perimeter fencing to me means it's on the property line. So if somebody comes and they want to put a fence halfway through their front yard, I think arguably you can say, no, this, that's not a perimeter fence. Perimeter means perimeter of the lot. But again, these are things that are likely to be litigated in the next few years. Okay, so you've already answered the next couple of questions several times. Yes, a copy of the PowerPoint will be emailed to attendees along with the link to the video. Uh, can perimeter fences be exclusive of utility easements? You know, the, the statute doesn't, let's see. I don't think the statute directly addresses that it cannot be on an easement. Um, and I think in the policy that we write, we, we have language in there that kind of warns people, if you put your perimeter fencing on a place where someone has superior rights to that property, meaning an easement, um, you know, the easement holder can come and say, you can't have your fence on the property or your your fence is interfering with my easement, um, my my use rights under the easement. So I don't know that you can deny it just because it's on an easement. I, I think that's again, we'd have to look at the governing documents um, and maybe have kind of some saving language saying just warning people. We don't know if you're on an easement or not, but if you are, be aware that uh, the easement holder may have superior rights and possibly could make you move this fence or just take it down. Okay, next question. Can we deny a request for a paint color, or I'm assuming based on the fact that it's not complimentary to the neighborhood, they have a guideline that says harmony in the neighborhood. Is that the eye of the beholder? 
Right. And so I, I should have mentioned that because I thought of it when I was talking about, you know, I mentioned that uh, that typically you want to be able to point to some language in your deed restrictions when you have a denial. Well, sometimes it just doesn't look right. Um, you know, like if you're if you've got a house and every house in there is made out of brick and somebody says, I'm going to put a metal house in and you've got that clause, which is a somewhat common clause in, in architectural language that it has to be in harmony of external design with existing or surrounding structures. Um, you know, that that's clearly something that's not in harmony. Metal house in an all brick house subdivision. Um, but keep in mind that that is like this question kind of implies that's a subjective determination and it can get really sticky on things like paint colors. Um, so there may be an instance or if you've got that language that's there for a reason and you can use it but you should just know that if it's not crystal clear you know that can come down to an understanding well that's your your determination of what's in harmony is not reasonable and that that can give them a ballot a, a basis on which to challenge that determination that it's really not reasonable you know like if somebody on one house has a tan and the person next to it has a beige and you deny them you know you're probably going to lose that argument um, because you know that, that's really a subjective kind of on the edge decision um, but that we are aware that that language is in there and we've had associations that use it our advice is if you use it, it it really needs to be something that that is clearly not in harmony or else you're just going down that road of subjectivity and um, subjectivity and association decisions leads to lawsuits all right, we're gonna move back to fences here. This one's about fence height. So current published security fence standards call for fences to be at least six feet high. But what happens if the governing documents restrict heights to five feet? What should be followed? Um, you know, that that's the thing is this, this, like I said, the law says that the association can regulate the type of fencing without any definition of what that means. I believe in our policy, we generally write it at six feet, um, I've put eight feet in there for a few. We think if you try to go lower, that an owner can say, well, that's not security. Um, you know, there was some associations that we want to make it four feet. Well, you know, four feet is to me is clearly not security unless it's, uh, you know, you're being attacked by toddlers. But uh, six feet is reasonable, eight feet is reasonable. We think that, that the security measure fencing allows for something or possibly allows for something taller than what's in your declaration. Um, if the if if someone makes an argument that what's in the declaration doesn't provide enough security. So again, that's one of those gray areas to where we uh, we just don't know what the answer is. I mean, we, we have restrictions where in some cases where they do allow four foot fencing in the front yard. And I mean, we, we don't think that would survive a challenge where somebody says, well, you, you can only do four feet security fencing because that's what it says in our declaration. Because like I said, four feet is really not security. Anybody can get over that. Um, so it, it's just a gray area until some courts start telling us what it means. All right. We got a lot of questions left in only about five minutes. So we'll try to get through as many of these as fast as possible. So do you have a recommendation for somebody that's already or for an association where someone's already made the improvements to their homes but did not seek a ACC approval? What can the association do? Well, ultimately, the you know the remedy for a deed restriction violation, and that would include an unapproved alteration, is to um, file a lawsuit and ask a court to tell them to undo it. Now that's easy to say, hard to do. Um, the first thing I would do is determine if they would have applied, would that have been approved? And if so, you know, I don't think the association wants to spend any money pursuing that. Um, you know, in that case, you might just want to send them a letter saying, hey, we noticed you did this, you didn't submit an application, it will be approved, so please fill out this application. I've got a couple of associations <clears throat> that just in their ACC guidelines will it'll state that if someone makes an alteration that has not been approved but would be approved, the association fills out an application form and approves it. Because what they're trying to avoid there is that someone to come along down the road and say, well, you don't enforce the requirement for an ACC application, so I don't have to fill out one. So at least they have one on record. 
Um, now, if it's something that simply would not be approved, uh, you know, again, your remedy is to file a lawsuit, explain to the court that the documents, the governing, uh, the deed restrictions required ACC approval. They prohibited, you know, a storage shed that's within two feet of the property line. This owner put a storage shed right on the property line and didn't get approval. So they violated two restrictions. And we want you court to order them to remove that storage shed. And and that's the remedy. And, you know, it becomes a little more difficult if somebody is uh, puts on an addition to their house because courts don't like to tell people to tear things down. Now, they've, they've done it and they'll do it. But, you know, that's something that you really don't want to count on as a judge telling an owner that they've got to tear down that $50,000 room that they just put on their house. Um, that's why it's important in ACC issues, if somebody starts unapproved construction, <clears throat> is to try to get them a cease and desist letter, which can be sent by the management company. Uh, our office sends a lot of those. Sometimes it might carry a little more weight if it's coming from an attorney because we're going to tell them you either stop or we're going to sue you. And if they refuse to stop, the next remedy is to file a lawsuit seeking a temporary restraining order, which is a somewhat immediate order that the court can sign that tell somebody you've got to stop what you're doing. Um, and if you continue doing it in spite of this order, they can be held in contempt of court. Um, temporary restraining orders are typically good for two weeks. There's a way to extend them for an additional two weeks. At the end of a temporary restraining order comes a temporary injunction hearing where you want the court to order them to stop what they're doing until the resolution of the lawsuit. And then there's a trial where the court makes a final ruling is you can't do that or you can do that. You know, the, the problem or the issue with those lawsuits is they're extremely expensive from the get go. A temporary restraining order means that an attorney files that lawsuit, typically goes down to the court that day, waits to talk to a judge, gets in front of a judge, has a hearing. And if it gets granted and a temporary injunction hearing becomes necessary, the temporary injunction hearing is actually like a trial. And it's the full rules of evidence and witnesses. So they can be very expensive. That's something, you know, you really want to use in the most extreme circumstances where somebody's doing something that you really want has to be stopped right then and there. Okay, we've got a couple of minutes left real quick. The name of the YouTube channel is just search RMWBH. You can also access it via our website at rmwbh.com. Uh, let's see. Does the board have to bring in the ACC members at the meeting, or can they just uh, name the people? And um, so the, the naming the committee is not one of the 15 items that has to be done in the open session of a property notice meeting. I would encourage that you do it that way. It's just transparent. I, I think this is what they're asking, Kyle. Um, I would suggest that you, you know, always name committees in the open session. Um, just for transparency's sake, you know, it, uh, owners sometimes tend to think the board's doing things in secret behind their back. And the best way to avoid that charge is just to do all the business you can in the open session of a properly noticed meeting. Hey, we'll get to this one last question real quick. What is the protocol the association should take if there's a fire code outside of the design guidelines that does not allow combustible material within five feet of a structure? The owners want to switch what the builders installed. How should an association respond? So generally, the association cannot enforce the fire code um, or city ordinances or whatever it may be. There, there are some restrictions that say you have to comply with those ordinances, so you might have something there. But if it's a, you know, a governmental ordinance or a code, and you think an owner is violating that, you need to make your complaint to the appropriate governmental authority to see if they will take a look at it and do something. You know, you can't deny something because it may violate a city ordinance or a county ordinance or a code unless your documents give you the authority to do so. All right, it's after 1230. All right, well, thank you, everybody. Hopefully something I said helped. Uh, and hope you show up for the next one. <laughs>